Hello my bookworms, welcome back to my channel. Today is a book haul, as you can tell, so let's get right on into it. So what's up, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for being here and hanging out with me for a little bit. Barnes & Noble has done it again, which means I have done it again. And I am referring to the 50% off hardcover book sale. <laughs> we did some damage, folks. <laughs> we have over 20 books to talk about today and 11 of them are from that sale. <laughs> I've organized the stacks a little bit, I'm prepared. So the first four books we're gonna talk about are thriller and horror, that sort of vibe, you know what I'm saying? The first one is The Beast You Are by Paul Tremblay. This is his like collection of horror short stories. I say short stories, but one of them is actually like half the book. This chunk right here is the final, the 15th story in the book. All 14 others make up the other little chunk. Just a flavor of what is inside this book is a middle schooler's younger brother takes solace in the dead thing to cope with their parents' separation and erratic substance fueled behavior. Isolated, suffering from amnesia and exhausted from physical therapy, a person regains their wits and strength just in time for the last conversation. And every 30 years, the animal citizens of Beevor enact a ritual without question, sacrificing one of their own to a monstrous creature in the woods, revealing the beast you are, to a cat and a dog whose lives and destinies are forever altered following the disturbing and horrific ceremony. I'm always intrigued by short story collections. I think that having a horror short story collection is even more intriguing to me. I'm really excited to pick this up, especially going into the spooky fall season. The next one is one of my most anticipated. It sounds so awesome. I'm really, really stoked about it. It is Mr. Magic by Kirsten White. The idea surrounding the story is about a group of former child stars who are reuniting to kind of uncover the secrets of why their show actually ended and who Mr. Magic really is. Apparently there are no like surviving footage of the show, no evidence of who produced it or who the host actually was. And now memories are all that the kids, now grown adults, have to remember and try to figure things out. It sounds like the perfect storm for a truly unhinged chaotic story, and I am so excited to read it. Ah! And throw it across the room. The next one is The Quiet Tenant by Claymont's McAllen. This cover is really strange. <laughs> the next two don't really remind me of thrillers. For this one, it's the it's the font. I don't really see this font as being like thrillery. I get like the moody little atmosphere going on with the picture, but I don't know. I was surprised to learn that this was a thriller. But it sounds really interesting. It is a psychological thriller about a serial killer, but it is told from the perspectives of the three people who are closest to him. His 13 year old daughter, his girlfriend, and the victim that got away. I can only imagine how different those perspectives are going to be and how much insight we're gonna get regarding each different point of view. Again, sounds like it has the potential to be a truly interesting story, but it's about a serial killer, so it's going to get a little bit messy. Okay, this next one, I am like 90% sure that this is the book that a lot of my patrons were talking about and I was specifically told by a couple of them that they think that I would enjoy this book. And from what I hear, it is very exciting and it sounds right up my alley. It is Just Another Missing Person by Jillian McAllister. And on surface, it's like another missing person case, but the person they're after is out there. His weapon isn't a gun or a knife, it's a secret. And we have two main characters, it looks like, Olivia and Julia. Olivia is 22 years old, no history of running away, last seen on CCTV entering a dead end alley and not coming back out again missing for one day and counting. And then Julia is the detective heading up the case. She knows what to expect, a desperate family, a ticking clock, long hours away from her daughter, but Julia has no idea how close to home this case is going to get because her family's safety depends on one thing. Julia must not find out what happened to Olivia and must frame somebody else for her murder. There is just enough intrigue that makes me really inclined to pick this up sometime soon. And I'm trusting the greenhouse in saying that they think that I'll like it, which I, again, surface level, seems like I agree with. Okay, now I'm we're going to get into fantasy, but I'm gonna bridge the gap with like a little gothic horror fantasy moment to lead us into full fantasy. You know what I'm saying? It is A House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. I love T. Kingfisher's writing. She is short, concise, gets to the point with all of the punch to have a phenomenal book. In the story, we're following our main character, Sam, who is going to visit her mom in, I'm, I think it's the house that she grew up in, perhaps. She doesn't get to see her too often, so she's excited for this extended stay. But when she gets there, she realizes that mom is really acting weird jumping at every little noise surrounding her, and Sam finds a jar of teeth behind rose bushes, and not to mention the vultures that are circling up above. <laughs> so Sam is trying to get to the bottom of why her mom is scared in her own house, 
course, but obviously there are secrets that maybe she shouldn't unbury. The books I've read from this author have like this little bit of fairy tale and the touch of like gothic atmosphere tied in with that fairy tale element. It's like almost confusing, you know, cause you want it to be whimsical, but you know that it's creepy and it's such a great reading experience pretty much every time. So I'm really excited to get into another book from her. All right, let's get into some fantasy. The next book I got is the Atlas Paradox by Olive e. Blake. I have the Atlas Six. I have yet to read it, but I know the final book in the tr trilogy is what I almost just said. The final book in this trilogy is coming out relatively soon. Couldn't tell you the date. The Atlas Complex release date. Right now it says January 9th, 2024. So I have some time to catch up. I wanted to own this book so that I can read obviously the first two in order to, you know, read the final book in the series. So that's really pretty. Didn't know that was in there. Um, I can't read the synopsis of this because I still have to read the first book. <laughs> but the first book is the Atlas Six and it is, from what I remember, it has this magical tournament. And in this tournament, they're fighting for a place among the Alexandrian society who are caretakers of lost knowledge from the greatest civilizations of antiquity. And those who secure a place among them will have a life of wealth, power, and prestige beyond their wildest dreams. And each decade, only the six most uniquely talented magicians are selected to be considered for initiation. So our six main characters are entered into this little tournament of whatever it is, testing every facet of like their mind, body, soul, magic things. And only five of them will get through to the next year of their life. So that's the Atlas Six. And this is the Atlas Paradox, which is the second book. Then comes the Atlas Complex, which is the final. So I got the second one so that I will be able to read the first two in preparation for the third. The reason that I bought the next one is going to be insanely obvious. And the fact that it was 50% off, there was no reason, zero reason why I shouldn't have gotten it. And it is a Dragonfall by L.R. Lamb. Look at this cover, absolutely stunning. This one is the start of another series. Ooh, you hear that? Hasn't been opened once. It says, long ago, humans betrayed dragons, stealing their magic and banishing them to a dying world. Centuries later, their descendants worship dragons as gods, but the gods remember and they do not forgive. Our main character is Arcady, who is a thief and he steals an artifact from the bones of a plague bringer, the most hated person in Lumet history. Only Arcady knows that the artifact's magic holds the key to a new life among the nobles at court and a chance for revenge. And then our other main character is a dragon disguised as a human whose name is Evrin, who soon learns to regain his true power and form and fulfill his destiny. He only needs to convince one little thief to trust him enough to bond completely body, mind, and soul, and then kill them. Yet the closer the two become, the greater the risk both their worlds will shatter. Sounds like it's gonna get messy because you know that they're gonna start to like care for each other and things like that. Unless the dragon could be insanely ruthless. I don't know, I'm gonna find out because it sounds right up my alley. Okay, the next four books are both part of duologies. So separate duologies, obviously. This first one, FOMO got to me. I just, I've seen it everywhere. I know it's on Kindle Unlimited, but my toxic trait is that I want to own the physical books. I don't know what else to tell you other than I have them in my hands. And plus they're really nice hardcovers, all right? They're like the really heavy, like insanely square ones. You know what I'm talking about? It is the the Crowns of Nyaxa, which is the Serpent and the Wings of Night and the Ashes and the Star-Cursed King. These covers are so similar, it's crazy. And it's just a joy. It is a joy to have. I know nothing about this. I know it's like romanticy. I think. Ooh, I love that. The synopsis is sh so short. It says, do you want to change this world, little serpent? Then climb your cage until you are so high no one can catch you. Break its bars and make them your weapons. Nothing is sharper. Once you win, the world is yours. That is the time for dreaming. But this, this is the time for conquering. Oh my God, wait, I didn't know that the naked hardcover was also stunning. <gasps> I'm so happy I bought these. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, it's a little crest and it says House of Night. Oh my God, it says never trust, never yield, always guard your heart. That's adorable. I love this for me. And then the other one, let's see. Heck yeah, it's also House of Night, but it's a little more purpley. And this quote says, love is a sacrifice at the altar of power. Sounds like romanticy to me. But I also know that this book is getting picked up by a publisher, I believe. So these covers might not be in existence soon, which was the deciding factor as to why I ended up getting them. Because if I really like it, then I'll want to have first editions. You know what I'm saying? This is how my brain works. I also just found out that there's an actual synopsis on the back of the book. So that cute little like quote, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> Didn't know this was vampire. <laughs> this one is a magical tournament as well. Yes. It says that we have our adopted human daughter of the nightborn vampire king, who is Araya. She's carved her place in a world designed to kill her. Her only chance to become something more than prey is entering the Kajari, a legendary tournament held by the goddess of death herself. She is forced to make an alliance with a mysterious rival who is Rain. He's dangerous, he's ruthless, he's a vampire, an efficient killer, an enemy to her father
father's crown and her greatest competition. Yet, what terrifies Araya most of all is that she finds herself oddly drawn to him. Yes, romanticy. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm really excited. I have just seen people have a lot of fun with this one, so I was excited to have them both on my shelf. And then the next one, it's a little bit out of pocket for me because I don't read a lot of YA, but let me tell you. <laughs> I follow this author on Instagram and she's so freaking funny, <laughs> which makes me want to read her books. Like, I really love all of the reels that she posts and it just makes me want to support her. This is a similar situation to the Atlas Six, where I know I said like five minutes ago that it was a duology, but I'm wrong. It's a trilogy. The third book comes out in March 2024, but now I have the first two. And the book is Realm Breaker by Victoria Aveyard, and the second book is Blade Breaker. So we have Realm Breaker, Blade Breaker, and then the third one is Fate Breaker. I love all three of these covers so much. And even though I don't read YA a lot, I mean, it doesn't mean I don't like it anymore. I just have to be in the mood for it. So I'm a big fan of how these covers look on the shelf, and this interior map really did it for me. I love a good fantasy map and this one is just like really stunning. I love how classic this book sounds. So our main character is Corain, and of course there's a villain plotted against her but alongside an unlikely group of reluctant allies, Corain finds herself on a desperate journey to complete an impossible task with untold magic singing in her blood and the fate of the world on her shoulders. It sort of reminds me of Children of Blood and Bone but I don't think that this one actually has any sort of romance plot to it or if it does it's not very much a thing because I vaguely remember Victoria Aveyard posting some reel about how her stories don't really have romance in it. But the similarities are sort of there and Children of Blood and Mode is one of my favorite books. So I think that I could have a lot of fun with this and I'm really excited to get into them. All right, moving more into like contemporary titles and a couple nonfiction. Let's start with those. Caleb has his own copy of this book and I want to read it, but I might want to annotate or something. So I got my own copy and it is The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. I'm very much someone who gets a lot out of books like this. And I don't even know how to talk about it without sounding extremely cheesy, but living a creative lifestyle is something that I really strive to have, you know? Like I love my like critical thinking neuro ICU job, but I also really, really love being at home and creating content and doing other sort of creative things with my mind and hands. And I really do think that I will get a lot out of this read. Caleb has said to me multiple times, like Sydney, you need to, you need to be reading this. Like you, you'll love it. And it's a book of like short little vignettes that build off one each other as the book continues. So this is going to be a book that I read a little bit from like every day, every other day at no like sort of rush pace. Like I'm just going to take my time and read through it. It's going to be sitting on my like currently reading shelf for a while probably just as I get through it on my own time. And I'm really excited about it. The next one, wow, also really excited about it because well, if you know anything about me, you get like, yes, I love dragons, but I also love ships. And this one is a nonfiction. Wow, who is she? It is The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder. I'm so excited about it. I have heard really, really good things about this title. And look at this cover. Wow. So like I said, this is a nonfiction and it is in the year of 1742, a ramshackle vessel of patched together wood and cloth washed up on the coast of Brazil. Inside were 30 emaciated men, barely alive, and they had an extraordinary tale to tell. They were survivors of his majesty's ship, The Wager, a British vessel that had left England in 1740 on a secret mission during an imperial war with Spain. While The Wager had been chasing a Spanish treasure-filled galleon known as the Prize of All Oceans, it had wrecked on a desolate island off the coast of Patagonia. The men, after being marooned for months and facing starvation, built the flimsy craft and sailed for more than a hundred days, traversing nearly 3,000 miles of storm-wrecked seas. They were greeted as heroes. But six months later, another, even more decrepit craft landed on the coast of Chile. This boat contained just three castaways, and they told a very different story. The 30 sailors who landed in Brazil were not heroes, they were mutineers. The first group responded with counterchanges of their own, of tyrannical and murderous senior officer and his henchmen. It became clear that while stranded on the island, the crew had fallen into anarchy with warring factions fighting for dominion over the barren wilderness. And accusations of treachery and murder flew. The stakes were life and death for whomever the court found guilty would hang. It's like a real life piratey thriller story. Like I am so, so excited to read it. The reviews of this book just talk about how it doesn't read like a nonfiction. Like it reads like an actual like fictional story, but it is so real and I can't wait. I can't wait. I want this picture just like framed. It's so stunning. And this copy has actual photos 
photos too, which I literally might like take out and frame. I don't know, maybe. Wow, so beautiful. Moving into like contemporary things, ready? Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. This book has a lot of different covers. This is the cover that I have wanted. I have had this book on my Amazon wish list for quite a while, but I have now closed my Amazon wish list because I don't want to support that company. And instead, my wish list is now on bookshop.org, which is phenomenal because when a book is bought off of a wish list on bookshop.org or just any listing, it goes to your chosen small local indie bookstore, which is phenomenal. So I've moved my wish list to bookshop.org, but this cover didn't exist anywhere else. And I wanted this cover for this book. So I went ahead and just bought this one for myself. I had no idea that it was so small, but it says Kiko doesn't fit in. She's 36 years old. She's never had a boyfriend and she's been working the same convenience store for 18 years. Her parents wish that she would get a better job. Her friends wonder why she won't get married, but Kiko knows what makes her happy and she's not going to let anyone take her away from her convenience store. I've heard some mixed things about it, but ultimately it's so short that I don't feel nervous about putting my time and effort into it because from the reviews that I've heard, it sounds like I could really like it. The next one, a couple of my patrons have told me that I would really enjoy and fun fact, I actually requested this on NetGalley and didn't get it. So, wow, my ice machine is filling up. There we go. It is Old Enough by Haley Jack. Oh, not Jackson. Jacobison. I love this cover. I think it's so cute. <laughs> this is a debut novel. As astute, funny, and loving as your best friend from college about a young bisexual woman who is pulled between a new sense of community and loyalty to a friendship she's outgrown. The rest of the synopsis is actually pretty long and that is really all that I had to read in order to be interested by it because, you know, growing up and cultivating and fostering adult relationships are extremely difficult. No one really tells you that. <laughs> It takes a lot of work. And the fact that this book also has the bisexual representation is extremely important to me. Like everything about it sounds like it has the perfect, oh, I love the little comb on the side, Oh, <laughs> It just sounds like I could really, really get something from it and really enjoy my time reading it. So I was really stoked to see this sitting there at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> By the way, not all of these have been from Barnes and Noble, only 11 of them. I just didn't specify which ones. <laughs> Camera's dying. The cover of the next two books are what drew me in. I have never heard of them nor have I seen anyone talk about them, but I'm really interested in them. This one is Loot by Tanya James. I love the little tiger. He's so cute. It says it's a spellbinding historical novel set in 18th century India, England, and France about a young man's dream of leaving a mark on the world. It is a hero's quest, a love story, a story of a young artist coming of age, an exuberant heist novel that traces the bloody legacy of colonialism across two continents in 65 years. Like truly that last little paragraph is what did me in. Like it has a hero's quest, a love story, coming of age, and a heist. Like those are my favorite things. <laughs> Plus it has the cutest little tiger on it. Okay, this next one, tell me this cover isn't stunning. You can't, you can't do it. It's, it is The End of August by Yu Miri, translated by Morgan Giles. Look at this cover. This one says, in 1930s Japanese occupied Korea, Lee Woo Chiyo was a running prodigy and contender for the upcoming Tokyo Olympics, but he would have had to run under the Japanese flag. Nearly a century later, his granddaughter is living in Japan and trained to run a marathon her Herself. She summons Korean shamans to hold an intense transcendent ritual to connect with Lee Woo Chiel. And when his ghost and others appear, she must tell their stories to free their souls. What she discovers is that at the heart of this sweeping majestic novel, there is a family that endured death, love, betrayal, war, political upheaval, and ghosts, both vengeful and wistful. I'm a sucker for a really thick book. So when I saw this cover with this thickness, I just really, really wanted it. <laughs> And also since it's like a family saga spanning many generations, I love that. And plus it has some sort of like paranormal aspect to it with actual ghosts perhaps. Like, I don't know, it really could be fun. I'm really hoping so because that's a lot of pages to commit time to for a story. But like, if it has such a gorgeous cover like this, I'm way more inclined to go into it and be really excited. <laughs> I got one romance book and it is Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuinston. Y'all finally are getting to me. I have not read it. I wanted the paperback before all of the covers are the, you know, from the actual movie. I hate those covers. <laughs> I don't normally like stories about royalty. I typically just like, I just don't like them. They don't interest me, but I will say all of the little like stills that I'm seeing from the movie with the quotes, like I'm, I'm in, I'm drawn in. I think that I could really like it. And I'm a little bit worried that this is going to open up a whole nother genre of royalty for me. I don't know if I'm ready for that for myself. <laughs> but I am really excited. I will be reading this soon, most likely. Okay, I got some special editions too. 
I wanted these so bad when they came out. I wanted them so bad, but we were not in a place financially where I was able to buy them at that time. So I was hoping that I could find them later on, you know, in my life. <laughs> and I did find them on Pango Books. Obviously there, I think it's a little bit over face value, but still it was better than I expected them to be. So I got the Fairy Loot edition of House of Earth and Blood and House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J Mass. These are so pretty, I could cry. So they both have obviously this um, hard case through love all is possible, amazing sprayed edges, stunning cover, amazing interior, amazing naked hardback. Like, wow. And then obviously let me show you, yes. Yes, please. I've really, really enjoyed this series. Obviously, House of Earth and Blood is like one of my favorite books of all time forever. It's a comfort read for me, and I am just really excited to have these special editions lighted up in my hands. Here are my babies, and here is this naked hardback. Wow, I love the lightning so much. And then one more little set of babies, and the fact Wow, the fact that there's a little sea otter on here. You see the otter? I didn't know that was there until right now. The otter was like my favorite part. Not really, but like one of them. But yeah, this was a definite like treat yourself moment. I've been really wanting these and I was patient, all right? I was patient. <laughs> I decided that I deserved it, all right? I deserved it. <laughs> I also have the special edition because I participated in the Kickstarter for the Brandon Sanderson for secret projects. And the latest one was Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, which I think this is the only one in the four of them that are not in his like, like Cosmere. And I think this is the one that I am like most hesitant about because obviously through some of the illustrations in here, it has heavy like anime inspiration, which I'm excited to experience, but I also, I just, I don't, I don't watch anime. Not that I don't think that I would like it either. I just like don't watch a lot of TV. <laughs> the, obviously the cover and everything is so beautiful. This one says, Yumi comes from a land of gardens, meditation and spirits while a painter lives in a world of darkness, technology and nightmares. When their lives suddenly become intertwined in strange ways, can they put aside their differences and work together to uncover the mysteries of their situation and save each other's communities from certain disaster? I don't know much about it. I do see that there are different color texts throughout the story. Obviously the illustrations are so fun. I'm like, I'm hesitantly very excited about it. I just don't know what to expect. It's that sort of hesitation, you know? Cause I haven't really like been in this sort of world before. And I think it's exciting that Brandon Sanderson is like experimenting and doing fun things like this so that I too can experience experience fun things. <laughs> this morning I told Caleb I was filming this video and he goes, are you gonna show them my books? <laughs> So I will show you the two books that Caleb got at Barnes and Noble. Leave it to Caleb to buy two paperback books at a 50% off hardcover sale. Let that sink in. <laughs> the first one is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is one that he saw on the front table and he goes, have you heard of this book? And I said, yeah, I've heard really, really good things about it. I actually, when I was getting back into reading like three, four years ago, this was a book that I had in my Amazon cart at the time and I just never actually pulled the trigger and bought it, which I don't really know why, but I know that it has really worthwhile messages. I know it has magical realism and obviously it's kind of like renowned, you know, it's very popular historically. <laughs> so Caleb ended up getting this one. And then he got Secret Machines by, I don't even know how to read this. It's Secret, Secret Machines Chasing Shadows by Tom DeLonge. You know, the guy from Blink-182 wrote this book. <laughs> And it is book one and he almost bought the second one as well, but he decided to see how this one goes and then he might get the second one as well. But I don't know, it's like, it's a sci-fi. It's about aliens and things. Unidentified aerial phenomenons and governmental things, you know. It scratches the surface of the who do we trust with our classified technologies and featuring actual events and other truths drawn from sources within the military and Ill intelligence community, Tom DeLonge and AJ Hartley offer a tale at once terrifying, fantastical, and perhaps all too real. Though it is of course a work of dot, 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 fiction. <laughs> it just, it sounds right up Caleb's alley. He was excited about it. And I, of course, just get excited whenever he purchases any book and participates in my bad habits. <laughs> and that can be the cute little conclusion. <laughs> Let me know down below if any of these books sound interesting to you, or if you think that any in particular I should prioritize for myself. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for being here and hanging out with me for a little bit. If you are still watching, leave the tiger down below in the comments if you don't know what else to say. And while you're down there, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. I always appreciate your support. And of course, be kind to one another and happy reading. Bye.